year is 2147. The machines have already won, and 15 years of the Metal Wars have eradicated nearly all of humanity. But out of the ashes of defeat, Captain Jonathan Power and his Masters of Combat have risen up to become mankind's last hope of defeating Lord Dread and his Bio Dread Empire. But Captain Power can't do it without you. He needs your help. And you are an eight-year-old boy in 1987, armed only with a Powerjet X-T7 to shoot at your cathode ray tube television. But you're not just fighting Lord Dread and his Biomech army. You and Captain Power are fighting nearly every angry mom in America. I was flipping through the January 1988 issue of Popular Science when I found this article touting the future of interactive TV. Jim Schefter was reporting on a new show that combined live actors with computer-generated characters, and somehow it incorporated special signals from the TV that actual toys could interact with in real time. For the first time in television history, you could shoot at the bad guys and they could shoot back at you. I saw that the show was called Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future, and my immediate reaction was, what? I was a He-Man wielding Thundercat battling boy of the 1980s. Cool! Spider-Man! I was the exact demographic for a post-apocalyptic robot war spaceship shooting at the screen in my parents' den TV show, and I'd never, ever heard of Captain Power. Not the show and not the toys. I didn't have them, my friends didn't have them, my cousins didn't have them. How is that even possible? I had to find out why or why not. And what I uncovered is one of the most ambitious, influential, and controversial TV shows ever created. It had a dream team of talent that seemed to guarantee success, but outside of a small dedicated fan base, it's fallen into total obscurity. It's the story of a great idea, a really unique show, a groundbreaking toy line, outstanding talent, and a ton of money. What could possibly go wrong? Well, everything. You need to know about Captain Power. I started with the toys. It's like how you always just started playing an NES game without reading the manual. I teleported my mind to 1987, which is where it always kind of lives anyway, and I eBayed the Powerjet XT7, the Phantom Striker, the Power On Energizer, the Interlocker, Power Laser, some action figures, some birthday masks, and all three training VHS tapes. After my experience with Butler in a Box, my first question was, does any of this stuff still work? First of all, I needed two different types of batteries, a 9 volt and two double A's, which is kind of weird. So I powered up the power jet and popped in the first tape, which threw me into a beautifully 2D animated future war. It looks amazing. The power jet is also a gun, and I need to shoot the blinking red targets on the screen and avoid the blinking yellow ones. If you hit your target, it sounds like this. And if you take damage, it sounds like this. After every battle, you push a red button on the back that tallies the enemies you hit minus the damage you received and reports your score through an ascending scale of tones. That you then just have to count and remember or write down, I guess. You start with five points, but if you take too many hits and your score drops to zero, Captain Power is automatically ejected from the cockpit of the power jet, sending him hurtling down to his doom, which is really the carpet your mom wouldn't let you eat snacks on. And that's it. That's the 1987 future of interactive TV. There had to be more to this. And there was. A lot more. Because these radical 18-minute training tapes are not the TV show, they're standalone VHS games. And the manual says it works on black and white TVs, which were still prevalent at the time, so how could the gun even recognize the difference between red and yellow targets? 
How did this work? Well, to know Captain Jonathan Power, I had to watch the show. All of it. So I got the series on DVD. And that's when things started to get weird. Unlike the training tapes, the show isn't a cartoon. It's live action with a mix of 3D animated enemies. And I kept watching and watching and I didn't really see the toys anywhere. And the power on Energizer in the show looks completely different from the toy I have. I was three episodes into the show and I still hadn't seen a power jet, a phantom striker, or an interlocker anywhere. And the interactive shooting parts seemed to be really short sections of a dark, serious, and adult-oriented show. None of it made any sense, so I paused the show and started reading. And virtually all I found was hit piece after hit piece demonizing Captain Power for glorifying violence for children. What is going on here? All of this started when Gary Goddard was hot off the heels of directing Mattel's Masters of the Universe live-action film, the one where Dolph Lundgren is He-Man and Frank Langella is Skeletor. Goddard had a new idea and a good relationship with Mattel, so he pitched them a concept based around a name he loved for its simplicity. Captain Power. He couldn't believe no one had used it before, so he trademarked it immediately. I had the idea that we would uh, maybe call him Captain Power, and that he would wear these these suits, these suits that represented power. And I've actually, I thought, well, there must have been a Captain Power. There must, someone must have done a Captain Power. But in fact, no one had. Mattel had spent years developing interactive TV toy technology, but they didn't have any intellectual property to attach it to. Sales of He-Man toys were slowing down, and they desperately needed the next big thing. So. Why not marry their revolutionary toy tech with Goddard's vision for a live-action sci-fi show? Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future was looking like Mattel's future. Goddard got to work developing the show, which was centered on Jonathan Power and a small team of specialized soldiers wearing power suits to battle the robot army of Lord Dread, who became evil after merging with a supercomputer called Overmind. Eight-year-old Kevin and current Kevin agree, this is cool. Goddard wanted to partner with TriStar Pictures to handle distribution of the show's syndication, but Mattel didn't want to give up any piece of the money pie. They were confident they could distribute the show themselves, and this ended up being a problem. Goddard and his writers wanted to make a show with serious themes, with deep, nuanced characters and meaningful story arcs that would appeal to adults while also selling toys to kids. This ended up being a problem. Mattel invested heavily in manufacturing toys that they hoped would storm the market by creating the world's first interactive show for kids. And yeah, this ended up being a problem. But those weren't even the worst parts. The entire concept of kids getting into gunfights with their TV and effectively erasing the line between kids' show, warfare, and toy commercials ended up being a really, really big problem. In 1968, Peggy Charon was fed up with the state of children's educational programming on television, and she felt there were way too many commercials targeting kids. So she founded Action for Children's Television to make TV better for kids and families. And her group actually had influence. They successfully lobbied for the Children's Television Act, which set out rules for educational kids' TV shows. And by the late 1980s, she filed a formal complaint with the FCC and had an army of over 15,000 moms waging a media war against Captain Power, which she said teaches children wrong values. And they weren't alone. Peace activist Jerry Rubin announced at Universal Studios that he was doing a 43-day fast to protest Captain Power. And self-proclaimed TV mom Ellen Klein rated the show one star poor, with a headline declaring, violence is all there is to this show. The timing of the Goddard Mattel 
Captain Power project could not have been worse. We became the whipping boy for any group out there that wanted to get publicity for itself by attacking a TV show. But some people thought it was awesome. Legendary film critic Gene Siskel of Siskel and Ebert fame gave the show a positive review in their 1987 hour-long holiday gift guide episode. It was a segment that I knew existed, but it was gone, nowhere. The video on the official Siskel and Ebert website starts literally the line after the Captain Power review, which is really suspicious. It was lost media. And then, an hour before recording this video, I heard from a website called Platypus Comics, whose dad had recorded the episode on an unmarked VHS tape more than 35 years ago. So thanks to Peter Paltridge, we can finally hear Gene Siskel's review. I agree with you. When I watched this show, first of all, I expected this something called Captain Power to be a junk yeah. show. Uh -huh. This is well made. I think you can see that somebody spent some money on the special effects, on the dialogue. In fact, there's some real drama in the yeah. episode that I saw. Okay, so on one hand, we had angry moms across the country aiming their moral power jets at Captain Power and... On the other hand, one of the most famous movie critics on planet Earth was saying it was actually a pretty good show. What was the disconnect? Everything. Everything was the disconnect. Captain Power may have been the most monumental disconnect in television history. But first, you need to know how the toys actually worked. The interactive technology utilized photo detectors, sensors that measure the intensity of light. The red targets on the enemy robots flashed with a 30 hertz signal, 1 60th of a second on and 1 60th of a second off, with a 1 30th of a second cycle. The yellow signal for the enemy's return fire pulsed at 15 hertz, 1 30th of a second on and 1 30th of a second off, with a 1 15th of a second cycle. A microprocessor then determined whether you scored a point or lost a point based on the rate that the voltage spiked over a period of time. The color of the light on the screen was just a visual indicator for the viewer to differentiate between what to shoot and what to avoid. So the photo sensor is constantly looking for either of the two flashing patterns and pulling the trigger either registered a hit or helped you dodge damage. When the crew first got the finished toys from Mattel and tested them on the show, they didn't work at all. The targets were way too small, so they had to scramble to completely remake them four times larger so that their interactive show was actually interactive. But surely the interactive element was naturally woven into the show seamlessly because that is the whole point of the project, right? No. The answer is no. The entire gimmick ended up being shoehorned in after with an extra third production unit filming interactive action scenes that could be plunked in at the beginning of an episode. And the writers and producers were totally blindsided. When they put the show together, they didn't think the interactive technology needed to have big, ugly targets at all. They were under the impression that it would all be invisible and not interrupt the show. That way, if you had the toys, you could use them. And if you didn't, you could just watch a cool show. The show's developer, Mark Zickry, described the production nightmare that ensued. We weren't sure what could be done, what could be pulled off, how it would all integrate. In fact, when I would say, what can we do and what can't we do, they could never give me that answer. And so it was extremely difficult to write episodes that were within production parameters when, when no one knew what those parameters were. We knew that there were going to be interactive toys, and we would say, as writers, we were saying, well, will you be seeing the signal that emanates from the television to the, to the toys? And initially, we were being told, no, it, it would be an invisible infrared signal. And then when we saw the show and there was this flashing, you know, uh, chroma key thing, we were going, oh, no exactly how much interactivity this show was supposed to have really depended on who you asked. The instruction manual states, there are three to five minutes of action in each episode of the Captain Power television show that you can really play against. 
A January 1989 Starlog interview with writer Larry Dottilio said, We were given parameters of having to have a minimum of one minute and a maximum of three minutes of interactivity per episode. But a feature in the March 1988 Starlog nearly a year earlier said that creator Gary Goddard breaks the show down to approximately 30 seconds of interactivity. So the toy integration constituted either 2.3% of the show or 23% of the show and its creators and its actors like Tim Dunnigan who played Captain Power just wanted to make a great sci-fi series. Goddard said, it did bother us that the interactive toys, specifically the Powerjet X-T7 and the Phantom Striker, would be so closely tied to the show. You think? And that doesn't even scratch the surface of all the complexity and contradictions of Captain Power because the writers insisted they weren't writing a kid's show at all. A series bible is the reference document for screenwriters that defines a show's major elements like characters and setting. And Mark Zickery explained exactly how he wrote the bible for Captain Power. And I was committed to the idea that, that this would be an adult show, that we would create it exactly as if it were an adult show. We wouldn't uh, condescend at all. Does that sound like a kid's show? Meanwhile, Larry Dottilio lamented that Captain Power never quite got away from its kids show label. And he called Captain Power the worst title for a TV show ever created. Captain Planet seemed to do all right a few years later and Power Rangers generated over $6 billion in toy sales in less than a decade. So yeah, the name wasn't really the problem here. The point is, the writers set out to create a serious drama set in a dreary hellscape that encompassed the enduring themes of love and loss and betrayal, the delicate intricacies of surrogate families, and uniquely human values embodied by fully fleshed out characters whose realistic but tangled arcs wound maze-like throughout the series. Mattel just wanted kids to shoot their TV. The towering six foot five Tim Dunnigan fully embraced his role as Captain Power. He traveled to toy stores, sweating in his big bulky power suit so kids could meet their hero. And 35 years later, he's still giving back to the fans through podcasts and interviews. He's proud of being Captain Power and he should be. It wasn't his fault that it ended in disaster, so whose fault was it? The secret here is in analyzing the incredible risks that Captain Power's creators took with the show because they're seriously astonishing. Yes, it was the first interactive toy TV show, but it was also a live action toy powered show at a time when everything was still cartoons six years before the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers proved that live action could sell action figures. It was also the first show to ever use CG modeled characters as part of the main cast in every episode in an era with no digital storage. So all of the visual effects had to be painstakingly layered on videotape. And it was a serialized drama, meaning it featured a story arc that really had to be followed throughout the season to fully appreciate the changes the characters went through. It wasn't a self-contained procedural show like Batman or He-Man where everything just goes back to normal by the end and you can watch and enjoy each episode standalone. The most obvious risk was that decision not to partner with a Hollywood distributor. Instead, it was up to each TV station to determine when the show aired. That could be 6 a.m. on a Saturday in St. Louis or 6 p.m. on a Sunday in Sacramento. Who knows? Kids needed to know. Kids in the 1980s whose lives revolved around awesome TV shows needed to know. But even those elements aren't what matter most. The real story is that 
the hidden influence of Captain Power, this forgotten show, was incredible. You may have noticed something about Lord Dread at the beginning of this video. He is kind of reminiscent of one of Star Trek The Next Generation's most infamous villains, the cybernetic organisms called the Borg. And not just their design, but the phrase Resistance is futile. Matching Resistance was futile from a Captain Power comic book. It launched one of the biggest debates in the sci-fi fandom, and the liner notes of the Captain Power DVD address it directly. And I also noticed some things. What about Captain Power's mentor, an AI recreation of his father who appears in a tube at the power base? He's pretty close to the Power Rangers mentor Zordon at their power chamber. Oh, and one of the main villains is named Lord Zed. But it's so much more than those tangible influences. The talent behind Captain Power helped define entertainment for a generation. Head writer J. Michael Straczynski created the massively successful space opera Babylon 5, which ran for five seasons and spawned six TV films. And in an episode of Captain Power, the character Tank reveals where he was genetically engineered. How you doing? When I escaped Babylon 5. Captain Power assistant animator Rob Coleman became creative director at George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic, where he worked on Men in Black and all of the Star Wars prequels, and he was the head of animation on the Lego movie. Captain Power had everything. So, how did it become nothing? Between the live action and all the visual effects, the show cost around a million dollars per episode, which is nearly three million dollars today. And the action figures also just weren't great. They articulated less than G.I. Joe's, and they were tiny compared to He-Man and Thundercats. The whole thing was a star-crossed Shakespearean tragedy before the ink was dry on the contract. Mattel needed a show to sell interactive toys that no one had ever played with and that no one even knew they wanted, and the show needed their money to exist, but the two visions never meshed. I'm convinced that a cartoon like we see in the VHS game built around the toys would have been hugely successful, and a live-action show marketed and distributed properly to adults, one that was completely divorced from the toys and interactivity, would have also been really successful. But combining them did not work out, and both sides share some blame. Even still, a lot of people loved this show, and they still do. As of late 2017, there were plans to reboot it under the name Phoenix Rising, and a 40-minute animated Captain Power fan film came out in 2021. But the Phoenix is still languishing in the ashes. People also loved the toys. You can find message boards flooded with fond memories of dads playing together with their kids. But the toy sales never reached the critical mass that Mattel needed, and when they failed to sell through their Captain Power stock at Christmas, they pulled funding on a season two that was already planned out and ready to go. The show's creators had hoped to phase out the toys completely, and they even blew up the power base in the final episode of season one. That was a power base with a toy Mattel was trying to sell. It really was a poetic final nail in the coffin of the conflict between the two. Gary Goddard spent years trying to obtain the show's rights from Mattel, and he eventually did, but it was too late. The talent had all moved on to other projects, the funding to revive it didn't exist, and Captain Power was officially powered off. Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future really did have everything going for it. It had the kind of budget creatives dream of. It had beautiful, unique designs, cutting-edge technology, 
an elite team of talent, and the weight of the Mattel juggernaut to flood the shelves of every toy store in the world. And it all failed. But Captain Power's tiny fingerprints are in so many of the TV shows, movies, and toys that you love. And they're all over the science fiction franchises in which millions of hardcore convention goers worldwide see both themselves and the future. And those fingerprints were left by a show you've never even heard of, one that you can't even legally stream anywhere, and one that's locked away on out-of-print DVDs. It reveals one of the strangest phenomena in science, technology, and entertainment, that sometimes the greatest impact you can have on the world is to fail. See you in the future.